The MCAT Podcast, session number 164. A collaboration between the medical school headquarters and Next Step Test Prep, the MCAT Podcast is here to make sure you have the information you need to succeed on your MCAT test day. We all know that the MCAT is one of the biggest hurdles you'll face as a pre-med, and we're here to give you the motivation and information that you need to know to help get you the score you deserve so you can one day call yourself a physician. Welcome to the MCAT Podcast. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray, your host here every week. I have the privilege of being joined by Phil from Next Step Test Prep. And this week, we're going to dive into something that I hope will answer a lot of your questions, something we've covered once before on the podcast a long time ago. But with the updates with the MCAT and, and now seeing it for the last several years, hopefully we can dive in, get a different perspective from Phil since before it was with Brian. And we're going to cover the classes that you're going to have to take as a pre-med student to prepare for the MCATs. And we're going to talk about the hidden curriculum and much more. So let's go ahead and jump in right now. Phil, back for another MCAT podcast. How are you doing today? Good, good. Having a a good day. Uh, Being productive. I'm in the zone. In the zone. a rarity. (laughs) For for a content, MCAT content creator, MCAT expert, what is being in the zone for you? Because I think a student listening to this is just like having a, a panic attack going, oh, in the zone means harder questions. <laughs> no, it's just uh, just being productive, doing a lot more stuff with students. And so just finished up with a couple of sessions with students and uh, they're they're starting to see some improvement. And uh, that's always, you know, motivating, not just for the students, but motivating for me because I feel like, all right, this is what we're trying to do here. Nice. Well, that's good. All right. What are we going to talk about today? So we're kind of in the beginning of the school year. I know we're kind of in the throes of it at this point, but the the MCAT calendar has pretty much turned. Uh, so the MCATs, you know, for 2019 are all over. And so the AAMC a while ago announced, you know, their dates for 2020. They haven't opened up the the registration stuff for that yet. But that kind of gets me thinking, like, what stuff can students be doing now to help better prepare them for when they take the MCAT be it in January or June or August of next year, um, just kind of thinking about like how ways to use their time that aren't maybe obvious things mm. for MCAT, but you know, and if they're taking classes, maybe one taking one class versus another. If you have uh, certain electives that you need filled, I know that I had some of those, and my advisors kind of helped me pick the electives. And then in hindsight, I'm really wishing that I would have picked different ones that would have really helped me with the med school pathway. Yeah. So just kind of thinking ahead of, of things that you guys can be doing now that might make things a little bit easier down the road as you start to prep for the MCAT. So let's, let's briefly talk about what you mentioned at the beginning. You mentioned that we're kind of in a lull right now. As we're recording this, it's the end of September. And a, a lot of students don't realize that there are no tests at the end of the year. Why, why, does, the, why does the AAMC not administer any tests at the end of the year? Well, so the big part is, is that anything after September, no med schools are going to accept it for that year anyway. Uh, September is already kind of on the cusp of the application cycle, the end of the application cycle. So if someone were to take the test, let's say next month in October, or it might be October when you guys are hearing this, or if you're listening back, who knows what time it is. (laughs) But um, the idea there is that like taking the test in October, September, Uh, November, December, January, February, it's all the same. And so the MCAT, the AAMC decides like, okay, we're going to take this like October, November, December and kind of ramp up and prep for the next year, uh, the next cycle of MCAT stuff. And so that's kind of what they're in the middle of doing right now. Kind of, I'm, I'm imagining they're ironing out all the kinks of things that they're kind of doing with the new MCATs coming out next year. And so even though this is the lull for those of us who are Um, you know, taking the MCAT or doing MCAT prep, the people who are building the MCAT, I imagine this is probably a little bit busier of a time for them these next couple of months. Busy. They're on vacation. Let's be honest. (laughs) Yeah. They they, they made all these MCATs years ago. They haven't been doing anything. They're just, they're just all on the beach sipping pina coladas, laughing at all of us taking the MCAT. They're, they're turning the knob going, make it harder, make it harder, make it harder. (laughs) Just ramping up the difficulty. Yeah. Yeah. That's what 
Um, you know, really, I want to talk about. So the the fact that the MCAT, you know, in 2015, it's getting so long ago that it's not really news anymore. Mm-hmm. But when the MCAT changed, they really had to ramp up the difficulty because the students are higher in caliber. And so, like, they're just better prepared. They're learning more. And so the old MCAT wasn't able to separate people as well. And so the new MCAT, you know, is a lot more difficult. And they even added a lot of stuff that is not technically in the prereqs. And and that's a little bit challenging. And a lot of people see that as it's a little bit unfair. The fact that they need to, you know, like prep for a lot of these courses that they don't have to take to get into medical school, but taking them would make it easier to get through the MCAT. And that's honestly by design, because the MCAT writers need to know that you're able to learn huge amounts of information, not just remember stuff from your old like courses, but you're able to pick up new stuff um, as you're preparing for the MCAT. And so just kind of dealing with the content volume. And so there's some courses and things that you can take that'll make your life a little bit easier as you're prepping for the MCAT that aren't really like prereqs and maybe a little bit um, unusual when most students kind of think about what they should be taking. Yeah. So a lot of students will often ask in the Hangout, uh, which is our Facebook group, like, I, uh, I'm taking the MCAT next semester. I've basically done with my prereqs. I'm, I'm looking at what classes will help me with the MCAT. I have uh, molecular bio or genetics, or they, there's some combination of classes like that, which aren't med school prereqs, which aren't really prereqs for the MCAT. How do, how is a student supposed to decide this, this quote, hidden curriculum that's going to help them maximize their MCAT prep. Yeah, I, I just want to notice, I love that use of the term hidden curriculum because that's actually one of the psych vocab terms <laughs> um, that the AAMC holds students accountable for. But um, like the the big thing is, you know, thinking about what the test is going to be, be you know, testing you on. You can always go to the AAMC and see their their outlines. They have outlines of the, this is the content that we're going to end up testing students on. Um, One of the biggest, most obvious ones is there's a lot of biological systems like, you know, endocrinology, respiratory, immunology, cardiology, and anatomy and physiology is not a prereq. And you don't need to take anatomy and physiology to take the MCAT or go to medical school. But all of a sudden, for some reason, there's a bunch of anatomy and physiology on the exam itself. And so that's always one of my first things is like taking anatomy and physiology is something to that's a, a good use of time. Um, not just because it helps with the MCAT. I mean, it does do that. And that's a huge reason in and of itself, but it also makes that transition into med school a whole lot smoother. So even if you've already taken the MCAT and you're just trying to figure out, like, I need one more elective to graduate with my degree, what, what class, what bio class should I add before I go to med school next year? Probably anatomy and physiology is my biggest recommendation because it'll, it'll make your life a little bit smoother as you transition there. Okay. Um, of the bio systems, it's actually, you know, I'm, I'm obviously really biased towards neuro, uh, because I love neuro and that's kind of my, my jam, but neuro is probably the highest yield of the systems in terms of what they ask questions on, uh, because they can ask a lot of questions in the physics section that are neuro based things about like the voltages of the membrane potentials. Neurons are kind of analogous to circuits. There's things you can do there. Um, a lot of neuroimaging stuff like MRIs and things like that. You know, it's really easy to cross that over into the realm of physics. Uh, so physics has a lot of neuro in it. The chem phys section, the bio section obviously can have a lot of neuro in it. And the psych soch obviously has a lot of neuro in it because um, psychology and neurology are so closely intertwined. And so they could ask you questions about, you know, cardiology or respiratory or immunology, but I think neuro is the easiest for them to cross over. And there's a ton of neuro questions in the psych and sociology section. So So what, what class would that be at someone's school to learn about that neuro? Yeah. Like any upper level neuro course. I know that in my undergrad, uh, there was a neuro course that I took. It was like a weird thing that it was like half master's students and half undergrad students. And it was like an upper level elective. Um, But I think that that is really useful. Um, And so things like if you're taking like a higher level bio for something that you think might help, uh, neuro is at the top of my list. Immunology is up there just because that's really complex. And maybe it's just me, but immunology was never my favorite topic. (laughs) Uh, Just so many different cell types. I feel like it was just memorizing things. Mm. Um, And endocrinology, because it's very complex. And I feel like most students, 
most people, if you go up to someone on the street and you ask them like, what does the heart do, right? Like, what's the point of the lungs? Like they all know that. But if you ask them, what's the point of the pituitary? Nobody knows. And so I think just your average Joe Schmo has a pretty good understanding of what cardiology and the, the digestive system and respiratory system are all kind of all about. But when it comes to endocrine immunology and some of the nuances of neuro, things get a little bit more complex. And if you can get a little bit of a stronger background there, that'll really help. So, okay. So as far as classes, let's, let's talk about uh, an, something else that comes up for students who are struggling with the, the, the kind of time frame, the timeline of, okay, I need to fit in this prereq and this prereq and this prereq. And, oh, if I take the MCAT here, I won't have this prereq, but maybe I don't need it or I'm missing two or three prereqs. Let's let's talk through since we're talking about classes and courses and things to take. Let's talk through a little bit, kind of your thoughts. And I know I did this episode a long time ago with Brian, uh, way back in like the the early teens of of the MCAT podcast. But maybe we can get an update here for the new MCAT. Is what what classes can or should maybe a student? self-teach and and learn the material on their own and potentially take the MCAT a semester earlier than if they would have to take a course for it? Yeah. So I think it's totally possible to self-teach yourself one semester's worth of material or one kind of field without having, uh, without having taken it while you're prepping for the MCAT. So you're self-teaching yourself like physics while you're prepping for the MCAT itself. Um, of the ones that I think are but there's kind of like a couple of balancing things. Uh, first off, organic chemistry. Orgo is like very unlike all the rest of the chemistries. And so if you haven't taken Orgo 1, you're going to have a really hard time kind of understanding what they're talking about. Um, but Orgo 2, which is also a prerequisite, is largely unnecessary. Um, that's one of the one of the the courses, one of the prereqs that very little of Orgo 2 shows up on the actual MCAT. Organic chemistry 2 is at least in my experience and most most of the students that I know, was focused more on just like memorizing specific mechanisms like Diels-Alder and Wittig and the Clemenson condensation. But none of those, like the MCAT is not making you draw mechanisms. And so you can get away with with without having taken Orgo 2. Um, I would say there's there's very little punishment if you haven't <laughs> taken Orgo 2 and you're, you're prepping for the MCAT. Um, physics is something that is also a little bit tricky. Um, physics one and two kind of combined, if you haven't taken either of them, that might be a little bit tricky. Uh, but physics, physics two is, you know, a little bit lower yield than physics one on kind of the prereq side of things. Um, and one of the last things is I would say biochem. And the reason I mentioned biochem is because that's usually one of the last classes students take. Um, as they're kind of going through their prep. And so if, if a student hasn't taken one class, it's usually biochem. And that's not the worst thing in the world because biochem in undergrad usually is very memorization heavy. Basically, I just want you to regurgitate the list of enzymes in order and the list of substrates in order and like what's all the intermediates. And, and the MCAT doesn't really do that. They're not going to ask you like, what's the third enzyme of the pentose phosphate pathway? Because that's like, that's just not something that the MCAT is interested in. They're more interested in, like, do you understand how this is regulated? Do you understand what's the point? Like, the pentose phosphate pathway makes ribose, which we need for ribonucleic acids. So, to make DNA and RNA, we, that's the whole point of the pentose phosphate pathway. And the MCAT's much more interested in that than they are having you memorize specific enzymes. And so, in a lot of biochem undergrad courses, it's, it's very memorization heavy. And so, that's something that can be a little bit tricky. Um, on the, the topic where you, you know, we we're kind of talking about like, you know, the bio courses that are useful for students. And this kind of like crosses over. I think, you know, I have a very high emphasis on psychology and sociology um, with any of the students that I'm working with because it's really high yield, surprisingly high yield. Most students don't recognize how many questions they see on this. And so a lot of students come to me and they're like, oh, should I just take a bunch more psychology and sociology courses? And I generally don't know is the, is the answer for that. Because if you take organic chemistry one at UCLA or Berkeley or NYU or Mizzou, you know, in my neighborhood, it's, it's all the same, right? It's, it's all going to be the same course and the things that you're learning are the same, but psychology and sociology, I feel like there's a lot more wiggle room where Why is that? Sociology, I don't know. Maybe it's just the scientist 
the strict scientist mindset where we we really want things taxonomized and reductionist and have like a very strict order. But I feel like, you know, you take a psychology course in undergrad, they might talk about Freud for two months or they might not talk about Freud at all. Kind of depends upon, well, they have to mention Freud, I feel like. But the the level of detail that they go into in the psychology and sociology courses in undergrad usually don't necessarily correspond to what the MCAT actually tends to ask a lot of questions about. Um, the MCAT has a very specific, like, organized list of these are the things we care about. And a lot of times, psychology and sociology courses just don't go into that. Um, and that might change from school to school. So that's one that's a little bit tricky going through there. Um, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Anything else that students should be aware of as they're kind of planning out their schedule, looking at what classes to take, maybe have a semester or two left before they take the MCAT and, and trying to figure out what to squeeze in? Yeah. So the the last bit, I, I know we talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago about um, the the huge amount of data interpretation mm -hmm. that's on the MCAT. And so if you can get into a course that's spending some time doing like journal reviews, um, which is usually like a little optional thing. Maybe there's like an, uh, an honors group you can join or something that's kind of like doing journal reviews. I find that that's really helpful for students as they, you know, try to figure out what's going on with these different techniques. Um, and that doesn't necessarily even have to be a course. Like if you're just, you know, if you're interested in biology, which hopefully you are at least passingly <laughs> interested in biology, um, you know, you can pick out some, some journal articles, maybe on topics that you specifically are interested in. Um, you know, let's say you want to be a neurologist and there's some articles here about Alzheimer's that, you know, the current research on Alzheimer's. So it's any stuff you can do there, you know, kind of working on that data interpretation side, scientific review, scientific journal stuff that makes things a lot better. Um, you can also, if you want to get real brown nosy, you can find that professor that you want to ask for a letter of recommendation and you could ask, you know, hey, do you have any journal articles that you'd recommend me to read and kind of go through that? And then, you know, then you can talk to him about that. And then you have, you know, an in with somebody who you want to have a letter of recommendation written by and you're preparing for the MCAT at the same time. So double whammy, it's twice as useful. Maybe we should do an episode on that, on on how to to read journal articles, how to how to use them potentially with a study group to to break them down and talk about them and, and potentially help with the MCAT. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. It, it'd be really nice, you know, having students like look at as well though, because like, you know, we want to kind of talk about the graphs and like, you know, what's the takeaway from this one? Like, Oh, this P value is garbage. Right. So you have to ignore pretty much everything that's going on here. Um, but yeah, that might be a good use of time. All right. There you have it again. That was Phil from next step test prep. If you are looking for some help with your MCAT prep, look no further than next step test prep, especially if you are looking for full length exams. Now we're going to be talking about the new full length exam from the AAMC in a couple weeks. But if you are looking for more full length exams, other than the four that, ne uh, that the AAMC is going to offer soon, then look no further than next step test prep. When I ask students what full length exams simulate the real thing Time and time again, students always respond, almost always respond, next step, test prep. The other companies they say are too hard or too easy or don't accurately predict my score, but most students will say that next step test preps exams do. So go to nextsteptestprep.com. You can buy four, six, or 10 full-length exams. You get a free one when you sign up for their diagnostic, and you can save 10% using the promo code MSHQ. Again, that's next step test prep, promo code MSHQ. Have a great week. We'll see you next time here on the MCAT podcast, where we're going to talk about doing math on the MCAT. This is MedEd Media.